Hello, I'm Professor Michio Kaku. I'm a professor of theoretical physics, and welcome to Cafe Classroom. Today I'm going to start off by talking about how I got interested in physics as a child. Now you may say to yourself, most little kids want to become astronauts, firemen, or what have you. Ever since I was a child, I wanted to become a theoretical physicist. And the question is, how? How did I get started? Well, it all started when I was eight years old. When I was eight, something happened which changed my whole life changed my whole attitude toward everything. My teacher announced one day that a great scientist had just died. Everyone was talking about it. And I'll still remember the newspaper that evening. They published a picture of his desk. And the caption said, this is the unfinished manuscript from the greatest scientist of our time. That picture changed my life. Because I said to myself, what could be so hard that the greatest scientists of our time couldn't finish it? What's so hard? I mean, it's a homework problem, right? Why couldn't he ask his mother? So I went to the library, and I found out that this great scientist had a name. His name was Albert Einstein. And that book, that book that was on his desk the day he died, containing his unfinished manuscript, was called the Unified Field Theory, the theory of everything. He wanted an equation, no more than one inch long, perhaps, that would allow him to, quote, read the mind of God. So I said to myself, I want to be part of this great journey. I want to be part of this great quest to finish that theory, the theory of everything. So I decided to read everything I could about physics. So when I was in high school, I decided it was time to do something. So I went to my mom and I said, Mom, can I have permission to build an atom smasher in the garage? a 2.3 million electron volt betatron particle accelerator in the garage. And my mom said, sure, why not? And don't forget to take out the garbage. <laughs> so I took out the garbage and I went to Westinghouse and I got 400 pounds of transformer steel. I went to Verne Associates, got 22 miles of copper wire and I built a 2.3 million electron volt electron particle accelerator in the garage. It consumed so much energy that it drained all the power in the house. Six kilowatts of raw power surging through the capacitor banks. So finally it was finished. The atom smasher was finished. I decided to turn it on. I closed my eyes. I plugged in the atom smasher, and I heard this huge crackling sound as six kilowatts of power surged through the capacitor banks. Tremendous power surging through the magnets. The magnets were so powerful that if it ran on DC and you were to rock, walk by my magnets, it would pull the fillings out of your teeth if you got too close. The magnetic field of my magnets was comparable to that of an MRI machine comparable to a machine found in a modern hospital. Anyway, I turned it on, I heard the crackling sound, and then I heard this pop, pop, pop sound as I blew out all the circuit breakers in the house. The whole house was plunged in darkness. So my poor mom, she come home from a hard day's work, see the lights flicker, and the lights would die. And she must have said to herself, why couldn't my son play basketball? Maybe if I buy him a baseball. And for God's sake, why can't he find a nice Japanese girlfriend? <laughs> why does he have to build these machines, these huge machines in the garage? Well, that changed my life because I got a scholarship to Harvard. I went to the National Science Fair and I met an atomic scientist. He immediately knew what I was doing. 
I didn't have to explain to him what an accelerator was. And he gave me a four-year scholarship to Harvard. And that began my career. That physicist's name was Edward Teller, father of the hydrogen bomb. Well, after four years, I graduated from Harvard, and he offered me a scholarship for grad school. He said I can go to Livermore National Laboratories, MIT, or Los Alamos to design hydrogen warheads. Because, of course, Edward Teller was the father of the hydrogen bomb. Well, I decided I did not want to work on hydrogen bombs because to me, they were too small. I wanted to work on something bigger, and that is the creation of the universe itself. You see, today we think we have that theory, the theory of everything. There is a Hollywood movie called The Theory of Everything about Stephen Hawking, the great physicist. But you watch that whole movie and you realize they don't tell you the name of this theory. The name of the theory is called string theory. And I'm one of the creators of string theory. So what is string theory? Well, you see, in the 1950s, we, we saw it to smash atoms for the first time. We would smash protons apart. And what do we find? More particles. We smash them apart, and what do we find? More particles. We were drowning in subatomic particles in the 50s and 60s. We had protons, electrons, quarks, neutrinos, pi mesons, kappa mesons, tau leptons, on and on and on. In fact, G. Robert Oppenheimer, the father of the atomic bomb, once declared that the Nobel Prize in physics should go to the physicist who does not discover a new particle this year. When I got my PhD from Berkeley, I had to memorize the names of all these goddamn subatomic particles. I would hope that in the future, when you get your PhD from Berkeley, all you would have to do is say, string theory, and get your PhD. Because we think that that is the final theory. So how does it work? From a distance, an electron looks like a dot. But close up, we realize that that dot is not a dot at all. It's a rubber band. When it vibrates this way, it's called an electron. But it could also vibrate this way, in which case it's called a neutrino. It could vibrate this way. The same rubber band can vibrate this way, in which case it's called a quark. So all the subatomic particles are nothing but musical notes on a tiny vibrating string. So what is physics? Physics is the harmonies of these vibrating strings. What is chemistry? Chemistry is the melodies you can play on these vibrating strings. What is the universe? The universe is a symphony of vibrating strings. And then what is the mind of God? The mind of God is cosmic music resonating through hyperspace. That is the mind of God. And you see, for me, this was very pleasing because when I was a kid, I realized that my parents were Buddhists. And in Buddhism, there's no beginning, there's no end. There's only nirvana, timelessness of consciousness. That is the essence of Buddhism. But you see, my parents, wanted the kids to be as Americanized as possible because during World War II, they were locked up in a concentration camp in California. So they wanted the kids to be as Americanized as possible. So I was sent to Sunday school, Presbyterian Sunday school. So I was raised as a Presbyterian. And in the Presbyterian church, there is a moment when God says, let there be light. There's a genesis. So there's two diametrically opposed ideas. One idea is there's no beginning, there's no end, there's just nirvana. And the other idea is that there was an explosion which created the universe. How can you possibly reconcile two opposite points of view? Well, you can. 
You see, Einstein gives us a picture that the universe is a bubble. We live on the skin of the bubble, and the bubble's expanding. That's called the Big Bang Theory. But string theory says there are other bubbles out there, other bubbles in a multiverse of universes. And when these bubbles collide, are these bubbles fission off a baby bubble? That's called the Big Bang. Now, my colleague, Stephen Hawking, who recently passed away, came out posthumously with a book recently where he says flatly, there is no God. How come there's no God? Because there was no time for God to create the universe. The Big Bang happened like that. Since there was no time for God to create the universe, there is no God. But you see, there's a flaw. There's a flaw in Stephen's argument because that assumes that Einstein's old theory is correct. But you see, Einstein himself realized that his theory was incomplete. That's why he spent 30 years of his life, from 1925 to 1955, working on the theory of everything. The theory of everything, that is string theory, says that there was something before the Big Bang, that our universe exists in a larger arena of nirvana. So you see, our universe had a genesis. There was a genesis in our universe, but there are other universes out there, constantly being created in an ocean of nirvana, which is a higher dimension. So nirvana is timelessness. So that's how you merge Buddhism with the, with the theory of genesis, and that is, we have continual genesis. And we're gonna prove this theory in the future. The European Union wants to launch LISA into orbit, the Laser Interferometry Space Antenna. It's a gravity wave detector in outer space. We hope to get baby pictures of the baby universe, a trillionth of a second after its creation. Once we get baby pictures of the infant universe from outer space, we want to look for an umbilical cord, an umbilical cord connecting our infant universe to its mother universe. And this would pretty much confirm this picture of the multiverse. So how can we possibly visualize Nirvana? Well, let's go back to when I was a kid again. When I was a kid, my parents would take us to the Japanese tea garden in San Francisco, a very famous tea garden. And there's a pond there. In the pond are carp and fish swimming in a two-dimensional universe. How can they swim? They swim forward, backward, left, right, and that's it. Anyone who talks about the world of up, up into the third dimension is considered a crackpot. There is no up. So I imagine as a child, there must be a scientist, a scientist fish swimming in this pond. And the scientist fish says, bah, humbug. There is no such thing as up. There's only forward, backward, left, right, because the pond is the universe. The universe is the pond. That's all there is, the world of two dimensions. And then I thought, what happens if I reached on and grabbed that scientist, lifted the scientist's fish into the world of up? What would he see? He would see beings moving without fins, a new law of physics in the world of up. Beings breathing without water, a new law of biology in the world of up. And then I put the fish back into the pond. What would he tell his friends? He would tell his friends, my God, there are people out there, people unlike anything we've ever encountered that move in the world of up, the third dimension. Well, what's the lesson here? The lesson here is that we physicists think, but cannot yet prove, that we are the fish. We are the fish. We move forward, backward, left, right, up, down. But anyone who talks about the world of up, up into the fourth dimension, up into another universe, 
is considered a crackpot until now. When you go to a planetarium and they talk about the Big Bang, you hear this question all the time. Children say to their parents, Mommy, Daddy, if the universe is expanding, what is, what is it expanding into? You see, if the universe is everything there is, and if everything there is is expanding, there's nowhere to expand into because the universe is everything there is. But you see, if the universe is a bubble and we live on the skin of the bubble, the bubble does expand. And what does it expand into? The third dimension, the world of up. So if our universe is expanding, then what is it expanding into? It's expanding into a higher dimension, hyperspace. And that is the mind of God. That our universe is nothing but a resonance. Music, a musical note, vibrating in a much larger arena of 11-dimensional hyperspace. Now, you may say to yourself, wow, that's pretty neat, but why should I care? I mean, what's in it for numero uno? What's in it for me? Well, in the short term, the answer is nothing. We're talking about a theory whose solutions are universes. Each solution of string theory is an entire universe. So for the short term, the answer is it's not gonna affect you at all. But in the long term, this is a theory of everything. Meaning that it's a theory of time travel. It's a theory of wormholes. It's a theory of hyperspace. It's a theory of other dimensions, other universes. One day, this could even save all life on the planet Earth. You see, all things must pass. Our Earth will die in fire. One day the sun will expand, five billion years from now. We'll have the last nice day. The sky will be on fire. The mountains will melt. The oceans will boil. And that's the end of the Earth. We came from the sun, and we will go back into the sun. We will die in fire. The sun will die in ice. We know that because the sun will use up its nuclear fire, become a black dwarf star, and just die in ice. The Milky Way, which you see every night coming out in the night sky, the Milky Way will die in fire because we will collide with Andromeda, and it's going to be a very fiery collision. The universe will die in ice, we think. The universe will expand, and it's expanding out of control. It's expanding faster than we thought. All the books are being rewritten. We're talking about a universe dying. But when the universe dies, there's one thing that intelligent life can do, and that is leave the universe. That is create a dimensional bubble, a lifeboat, that will allow us to go to a younger universe another universe where we can mess up that universe as well. So life does not have to die when the universe dies billions and trillions of years from now. But you see, this theory will also tell us if time travel is possible. If one day we can go across space and time, like in the movies, like on Star Trek, hyperdrive is a solution of Einstein's equations. Is that possible? That cannot be answered in relativity theory. String theory can answer that question because it is, quote, a theory of everything. And on that note, I would like to say that this is what I do for a living. This is my day job, and that is contemplating the mind of God. Hi, I'm Ravi Prasad from Parliament on King. Aside from the cafe, we also have a social enterprise catering business. We work exclusively with members of the asylum seeker and refugee community. We make food from their homeland the way they make it at home. Uh, if you'd like to support the work we do with the asylum seeker and refugee community, just click the link below, which you see in the comments. Thanks for supporting the work we do.